This morning, um, we are continuing a series on what every Adventist scientist should know. Uh, this morning's talk is on the Yellowstone Fossil Forest, and it will be given, given by Leonard Brand, PhD, who is the uh, chairman of the Earth and Biological Sciences uh, Department here at Loma Linda University. He's uh, getting ready to retire, so we caught him. Retire, oh. not retire. Uh, not Just retire. leave the chairmanship. Uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, so we caught you on the very last Sabbath we could mm -hmm. <laughs> and still be chairman. Uh, this is part of a series that we've uh, been talking about for several months now. Um, we've talked about the philosophy of science. We've talked about several questions on is there a God? And in fact, we've gone through all of them now, although we have to do the origin of life over so that it can be actually recorded. Um, we talked about how old is life on Earth. And next week, we'll be talking about paleocurrence, which is the last one on our list. Um, there will be challenges to young life creationism. Uh, we've talked about the Coconino sandstone already. And today, of course, is the Yellowstone Fossil Forest. And finally, um, we'll be talking about Ellen White's health messages. And today, it's the Yellowstone Fossil Forest. And with that, I will leave the podium to, or I guess the virtual podium, to Dr. Brand. I'm, I might just say that I, I think on the Ellen White one that I'll present, um, the gentleman who was a co-author of a book that we wrote I suggest has the first hard evidence on the nature of inspiration. So that's just a you know, little insight, a little, little tidbit uh, might get you coming there. <coughs> okay, Yellowstone Fossil Forest. As, as uh, Paul has said, I was here when, when this, this whole episode here was going on and when the research was being done, much of it here at Loma Linda and in GRI. And so let's uh, take a look at <coughs> the Yellowstone Fossil Forest. A challenge to scripture, question mark. Well, it was it proposed as a challenge to scripture, all right. Um, come back here. If you, if you go up to Yellowstone, Fossil, Yellowstone Park, there are these hills uh, around the park. Um, volcanic material that, of course, once would have filled this whole area. Uh, it's uh, much eroded away, and on these cliffs you find the things that we're going to uh, talk about. <coughs> That's all volcanic material. And the, the, the places where you find this, they're scattered. All these numbers are places where you find fossil forests. Uh, some of the, the, the best ones were up here in the upper part of the park. <coughs> um, to get there, at least at that time, you had to brave the icy water and slippery rocks in the stream. I think that might be Ariel, but I'm not sure who that is. Um, Earl Lathrop. <coughs> so anyway, you, you climb up these um, slopes and you find trees, living trees and not so living trees. And you see some interesting things along the way. But here we have one of the hillsides. <coughs> and it just looks like a bunch of rocks. Uh, well, it is. Uh, but the, there are, there are many horizontal beds in here. Um, each one would have, would have been deposited, of course, at one time. And then there are trees in there that were proposed as being trees that grew there. A forest grew there uh, until it was um, overcome by another, another episode of volcanism, uh, brecchias, that is broken up volcanic rock, and, and uh, lahars or uh, volcanic mud flows, killed the forest, and then time went on and finally uh, uh, gradually a, a new forest grew. Same thing happened again many times. <coughs> so you have a series of one forest above the other, and there, there, are, um, there were at least 65 of these layers in, in one place where they had the most exposed. And the trees, some of them have up to a thousand rings, <coughs> not all by any means. So uh, it would have taken uh, 
certainly quite a few tens of thousands of years for this to form by the standard interpretation which was the forests grew there in place and were replaced one after the other. <coughs> and this is of course in addition to all the other rocks that are in the area. Of course right here there isn't much else. It sits on Cambrian or Mississippian rocks but in any case it would not fit the biblical chronology at all. <coughs> and this was proposed then as, as at that time, this was kind of the big thing that says you can't take the Bible seriously about, about history. Uh, you have to accept that these are forests growing in place. Here's a, a, a diagram of what we would see in that cliff that we just looked at. So you got these horizontal beds of, of volcanic material um, with upright trees, um, prostrate logs, and lots of leaves and uh, pollen preserved, <coughs> and you have one above the other. This would be Cambrian or, or Mississippian uh, rock here at the bottom. Um, okay, so, so what do we do with this? This was being definitely argued to be evidence that says we have to give up the Bible. So it's, uh, the question comes down to really do we trust the evidence we have available at that time? Do we think maybe Jesus Christ, who inspired the Bible, knows more than those who study this? Uh, there are many choices that one, one has to make at this point. <coughs> and so here we have uh, one of the slopes. Uh, you can see there's a, there's a fossil stump right there. Um, there are, of course, living ones, and, and these are so well preserved, you really often have to look carefully to see if they're actually fossil. There are others, um, but we'll look more closely at some of, those, <coughs> some of those stumps. There's another hillside. Here you can see some a little more plainly, these lighter colored uh, structures. There's a very large one. And a couple of graduate students and two very nice um, stumps. Typically beautifully preserved. More of them. Uh, you see these big upright ones. There's another one here. A couple of them there. Smaller ones. So they're, they're upright. How could they be anything other than a tr forest that grew there? Uh, it, looks, it looks kind of plain. Here's a stump. Probably it's gone by now, seeing where it's sitting but uh, a large stump. And there were indeed large stumps and very tall trees. It was not just some wood scraps around. Uh, this is a, at the bottom of a, a stump that's mostly broken away. But these, uh, these stumps can be up to, um, say, four meters across. Okay, that's 12 feet across. That's a large tree. Ariel, do you know who this is? Hackett. Elder Hackett, okay. Uh, and here's another very large stump. Significant trees uh, here sitting upright. You know who that is? Brown. Oh, is that Brown? Okay, sure enough. Bob Brown. Um, here's one of the taller ones. Uh, fortunately, the, the, the rock has broken away enough so you can really see much of it. It's probably 15 meters tall, about 45 feet, sitting there upright. One thing we see, <coughs> okay, the, when you look at this forest, it certainly looks like it grew there. And uh, that's kind of where it s stood in, in the scientific literature. This, these trees all grew there. And the researchers from here who started studying this began to look more closely. Did this really grow there? <coughs> or was Dr. Coffin's model uh, a, a good alternative? And that is that they were, they were transported in from somewhere else and deposited here as these volcanic deposits were forming. <coughs> One thing you see here is that the, the roots, there are some pieces of roots here, but they don't continue on into the rock. Now, this was not something that could be very carefully studied with a lot of examples because the park wouldn't allow any excavation. <laughs> so if, only if you're lucky enough to find one exposed could you see what's there. But there were a few cases where they were exposed and you could see the roots did not go in 
um, into the rock. Okay, here's uh, something that was uh, a green stick fracture. That is, that's what you'd expect to see in a, in a live tree or a recently dead tree, uh, fracturing in this manner. This is the only case of that um, found, and also there are no roots um, down here. Um, then there, there was a discussion about the roots, <coughs> and it was argued that, well, there are some those trees, yeah, they don't have the big roots, but they have <coughs> some small roots. Those ought to be broken off um, if this uh, was transported in and carried around and then deposited. But actually, a uh, study of, of uh, trees living, or actually it was recently living, trees that had been broken out in one way or another, we find that, that small roots don't necessarily break off. It's the big ones that anchor the tree into the soil. Those, are, those get broken off. <coughs> and so that matches what we see in the uh, fossil forests. There's a <coughs> these le these levels, different levels of trees, are not always um, distinctly uh, separated from each other in the sense that there are trees that go grow come from a lower level, that go up through um, a le one or more levels above them. So here's a Here's a stump sitting right at this level. And this tree, okay, if this were trees, were forests growing there in place and replacing each other, this, this tree uh, would have gotten killed at the time when this, uh, all this volcanic material came in. And so it was sitting here all the time it took for another forest to get started and the time it took for this tree to grow. And, um, and yet it's still there. It, it has not decayed away. <coughs> and there are other cases like that. So why would that tree stay there so long, not decayed? And there was, there was particularly about this one, there was a, uh, a, a lot of discussion because the, at the base where these trees are, you find organic zones. Uh, there, the, um, those who believe these grew in place would say those are soil zones where the trees grew from. Uh, in any case, they do have organic material in them. And I, I don't really see a, a soil zone here, but there would have been, it would have been right along through here. And the argument was made that this tree has decayed away right where it came through the soil zone, which is what you would expect if it had grown there and been there for a long time. Um, okay, so is that really the case? Um, this is an illustration of, an, of a lot of these arguments that were being used. Uh, the paper by Dick Ritland and his son in Spectrum had roughly a dozen of those, and I've spent a lot of time analyzing those, and including this one. <coughs> okay, is, did this, is this from decay where the tree came up through the soil zone? It was sitting there in that soil zone for, for many, many years. Well, how would you do, know that? Uh, you can't decide that from just looking at it. Uh, is this decayed? Is that why it's broken out? Or is there some other reason? This, this zone is not only at the supposed uh, soil zone, but it's right here at the, at the slope. And so rocks falling down would hit this. And so what we really would need to know is, are, are these, is this decayed or is it just broken? Just broken up pieces because of being battered by by rocks. Well, what would be necessary is to take samples of wood from different levels here and analyze it under a microscope to see if, it's de if there's decay. If there's no decay, then that argument is, is empty. Um, it just must be broken off for some reason. <coughs> and so, you, but, so here you have this, this one is being contended over. And I, I, I talked to Dr. Ritlin, I asked him a question about this. I said, is this the only tree like this that grows through um, the supposed soil zone? And he said, no, there are about 20 of them. And I said, do the others show this same feature of being decayed or broken right at that level? And he said, no, the others don't. Okay, so why didn't he say that in his paper, in his original paper? Uh, you can't, if you've got a sample of 20 pieces of evidence, you can't pick the one you like and ignore the other 19. Okay, so 
Nobody's ever done the, the research, the microscopic research, to decide what's really happening there, but um, it does not look like the evidence favors uh, the, in, the in growth position model. Here is that tree closer up. Uh, this, these, the wood in these trees is um, almost always exceptionally well preserved. So it should not be hard to de decide if this was decayed or if it was just broken. Here's an example. <coughs> Fossil tree, beautiful rings exposed. Um, and th these are helpful in more than one way, several ways. One thing it does tell you, the trees are beautifully preserved. They didn't lie around for very long periods of time uh, and decay, because they're not decayed. The other way it, it, it helps is that you can, you can uh, study the rings. These rings are one layer per year. Um, these are fairly uniform, but many of them are, are not. You get a lot of difference in the rings, and you can use that for some purposes, which I'll show you in just a minute. Also, you can identify the wood and see if it matches the leaves and the pollen at the same place. Okay, when you look at uh, these, these rings, you see several things. One is there's a, there can be a great difference in the width. That tells you the difference between good years and, and bad growing years. So here we have some wide rings. That was, those are very good years. Uh, there was a lot of growth at that time. Others are smaller, not, so, not such good growing conditions at that time. And the trees growing together and one forest should close, pretty closely match. They won't be identical. Different trees respond differently, just like we are all a little different. But you should, um, overall, the pattern of rings should match at any given time in the, the trees growing together. Then there are other features that, that can be used to identify uh, trees. Um, this is a simple ring for one year. This one has multiple late wood rings. Uh, perhaps the, there were weather effects during that year that caused it to kind of slow down its growth at, at more than one time. So you get these multiple late wood rings. And then there are what they call early wood rings, the same thing. This is, this is one year and you have a kind of an extra ring in there. Okay, um, so this kind of research was done on the, the trees from fossil forest. Uh, here's one example. This is, these are successive rings from one tree. You see there was, there was a very good year here, a uh, pretty good year here, and not such good years for growth here. And so you should find that <coughs> in other trees. And there's the other things here. Uh, notice here are these, some of these um, early wood uh, rings. You got extra rings in there. Another one, two, two of them here. Um, some extra rings there. And so if we compare different trees, we ought to be able to look for those, see if they, if they match. Well, here are four, tr four different trees. The same um, part of the tree that where this signature you can refer these, these features as a signature, a unique part of that tree. So here we have um, some long, uh, long, wide rings, some very good years, and uh, some narrower ring, not such good years. This tree is, um, in general, kind of matches, but it's a little different. It doesn't quite match exactly. So you could argue whether this belongs with these or not. But here we have, um, the third ring, uh, we have some, some extra rings in here. And there they are there, and here they are here. So that matches. Uh, the same thing here, we have some extra rings which match here. Uh, not so prominent here, maybe not there. And some uh, additional rings. So here's a, here's a signature which could be found in several of these trees. So it looks like they grew at the same time. Okay, well, one, one difficulty is these, did not, these were not from the same level. These are from different levels in the fossil forest. So if they grew together, they grew somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And then were transported in here and deposited on different levels. There were, there were those who have tried to find this kind of thing matching on the same level, 
and uh, there was very little success in finding. Uh, there, one or two of their samples might have matched. But you find matching si ring signatures on different levels. So um, they, like I say, they did not grow there together. If they grew, either you have really, uh, you know, a big chance happening that these match, uh, which doesn't seem terribly likely. Otherwise, they grew somewhere else in the same together, then were transported in here and deposited in different levels. <coughs> okay, pollen. There's a lot of fossil pollen. Pollen is a very durable substance. The outer coat of pollen is, is extremely durable. You can take your rock sample or your, and, and you, can, you dissolve it in the very strongest of acids. Uh, and this, this is what comes out of it, the, the pollen. It, that acid doesn't break down the pollen. And so one can identify what kind of trees these are from. And this kind of work was done, <coughs> Yellowstone. And if you've got trees growing here, you've got a pine forest, say. The pollen underneath those pine trees ought to be, uh, you know, at least a lot of it, pine pollen. Pines and other conifers put out enormous amounts of pollen. Um, if you find other trees, not so much. If you find a, a broadleaf forest <coughs> with pine pollen or other conifer pine, other pollen, that's kind of inconclusive because if you have a, a conifer forest nearby, a lot of that can blow in. And so that's not, uh, you know, it doesn't tell you that much. But if you have um, a conifer forest and the pollen is from broadleaf trees, so that, that there's still clearly something quite wrong there. That should not be <coughs> under any normal conditions. Well, <coughs> this has been done for some of these. Um, some of these forests, uh, identifying wood is an arduous task, so uh, it hasn't been done for, for a huge number of them. But I'll, I'll illustrate here three different levels that have been studied that way. <coughs> so here's the, are the, the little brown things are pieces of wood, either logs or, or upright stumps. And the upright stumps, of course, is what we're really interested in here, not the logs, which could have been moved somehow. So uh, here we have one Q. You have a spruce bald cypress, a maple nearby. Of course, we don't know what's back inside the hill. But, but this is what we have here on, on the surface. So one Q, um, OK, we've got a spruce and a maple. OK, there's no spruce pollen here. Um, maple, uh, this is one we're looking at. There's no maple. Yet that's the trees here. There are other kinds of, of pollen. The predominant one is swamp cypress. And at least on this surface, there's no swamp cypress. Yet that's what the pollen is. And so um, typically, you don't have a real good match, sometimes a very bad match, between the pollen and, and the wood, the trees that grew there. <coughs> Here's another one. This is a quite a different kind of forest. Um, so let's just take a look at some of these. Um, here you got a yellow poplar, a sweet gum, and a dogwood. Um, you got quite a bit of conifer pollen, which again doesn't really prove prove the case. Alder is the most common in this group. There's no alders. Um, let's see, I don't think there are any alders anywhere in this forest. Uh, so that, but this is the most common. Um, <coughs> Over here, we've got sweet gum, which is uh, um, what's that? the eucalyptus, um, bald cypress, and there are some others here. So, five I. We have predominantly uh, conifer pollen and quite a bit of swamp cypress. Uh, none of these other trees represented, and so it goes. You have sometimes you can argue, well, yeah, it's okay. Others, they really are, are a bad match. The third one, this is rather a, a level that has a rather different forest. Uh, mostly conifers, pine, spruce, etc. cetera. Uh, one alder. So let's see what we have here. We've got, OK, there are some conifer pollen. 9A is here, there's spruce. The conifer means conifer pollen that they couldn't identify to, ex to exactly what kind of conifer. So that one could be said is OK. 
But look here, the, the, by far the abundance of pollen is alder. There's only one alder tree, and that's over here. And um, alders and the, and the relatives don't put out the kind of massive amount of pollen that, that conifers do. And this, the, the great difference in the forest is also of interest. Because we have here some levels that, that have trees representing high altitude, almost arctic climates. Uh, other forests have, uh, have more tropical and temperate forests. So certainly in the modern world, you do not have those kind of forests living together. That's a, a very big anomaly. Uh, so how did they all get mixed together? <coughs> the evidence doesn't support the idea that they, that they grew together there. Fossil leaves, <coughs> I don't have pictures to illustrate some of these. Actually, this work was done some time ago before the age, uh, th that was in the era uh, BD, before digital. <laughs> so there was a lot of great pictures that are just not around anymore. <laughs> they, were, um, they were not digital. So, but we do, we have a, a, a enough to illust illustrate a lot of this. Overall, logs and stumps are predominantly conifers. <coughs> the leaves are predominantly broad leaves. See, that doesn't match at all. Uh, these, the sequoia was a, overall, in, in that all the different layers, it was a very abundant tree. Um, sequoia put out a, a large volume of, of needles that fall down. But so where are all those sequoia needles? <coughs> predominantly broad leaves. Um, the wood, predominantly conifer. There's a poor match between wood, leaves, and pollen. It, it isn't like, doesn't look like a natural situation where a uh, forest of a certain kind of trees were putting down that kind of leaves and that kind of pollen. <coughs> uh, cones. Um, cones are, are, are very rare in the fossil forests here. Uh, if you go through you know, conifer forests, you find just a lot of cones sitting on the floor. And if these were overwhelmed by a volcanic um, episode, there ought to be cones. Uh, they're the ones that we do have are very well preserved. And so why are they so rare? There are a few, I mean, just a, a very few. Um, here's one. Cone, very nicely preserved, which uh, all the ones they found are nicely preserved. So it isn't as though the, the cones seem to decay fast. Because ones you do find are, are well preserved. Yet there are very few of them, which doesn't, again, look like a natural um, forest. Just kind of summarizing some of the features expected if trees grew in place and then were buried. Should have a reasonably good match of wood, leaves, and pollen in each area. Uh, you should have commonly good soil profile with well-preserved leaves and needles on top and then decaying as you go down through the soil profile. Um, more decay as you go farther down. And we'll come back to that here in just a minute. Logs, you should have logs in various stages of decay. Should have complete root systems, at least, at least uh, you know, fairly often, especially with the trees that are well-preserved. You should find abundant cones matching the nearby trees and the orientation. <coughs> I don't have a picture to illustrate that. The, when the trees, when s trees fall over, they get old or the storm knocks them down, whatever, um, they are, they're pretty much randomly in a, in a forest. Whereas the, the trees here are very different. And so let's, uh, this is what you'd expect if they grew there. What, but here's a summary of evidence for fossil forests growing elsewhere and being transported into place. Uh, there's a poor match, like we mentioned, of wood, leaves, and pollen. The organic zones are not like soil. Harold Coffin did a number of thin sections and, and examined them under the microscope. And you have uh, cross sections of leaves, quite well preserved. And then instead of, instead of the kind of material you'd expect in a soil, often you'll have a, a leaf here, a leaf here, and between them is uh, is just kind of pure uh, fine grain so, um, sediment, uh, often even graded. In other words, the bigger particles at the bottom, the smaller ones at the top. That all looks like something was brought in by water and deposited. 
It's not what you'd expect in the soil at all. <coughs> um, thin, they're thin, often missing, often there's no organic zone at all. So again, there's something odd. It, it, it looks more like what you'd expect if you have water transporting uh, sediment and carrying leaves and they are deposited together. And that would not be a surprise to have that at the time when uh, another volcanic eruption is coming through. Maybe there's a lot of water being going with it. Trees are very excellently preserved, very little decay. That does not look like a normal forest. You ought to have trees at, at many different levels of decay in a normal forest. Larger roots broken off, some small roots near the trunk. That matches what you find in trees that are uh, uprooted and, and transported somewhere. Cones are very rare, but well preserved. Okay, so that's evidence that seems to favor the transport model. Some more, trunks, trunks and stumps with similar alignment. So y you measure the direction of the orientation of each of these logs. And they, they are more or less uh, in a parallel. Not, not perfect, but pretty much parallel. Now the odd thing is, why are the stumps also matching? In other words, you, you take a cross section of the stump. It's probably not going to be exactly round. It'll be a little wider in one direction than the other. Well, those, those wider parts are oriented along with the uh, tr trunks that are lying on the ground. And that, that speaks of transport uh, by, some, by water that is uh, carrying them, and they're, they're, they're responding to the movement of water by orienting in that way. And this is um, pretty much typical of, of what you see here in the fossil forest. The tr these um, trunks are oriented, and the stump in cross-section are oriented along with it. Um, and tree growth line patterns across several forest levels, as we showed you with these close-ups of, the, um, of the rings. So all this seems to fit better with a... Um, a tr with a uh, forest that was that grew elsewhere and were transported in. In fact, some of those are really quite strong. Um, if you if you study the details of the evidence, it's really quite strongly in favor of that. But the, you know that leaves us with some, some questions. Is there a modern analog for this model where we can see this actually happening? And there are big questions about the transport versus um, growing in place model in the sense that. These are up on a, on a high elevation. It's been eroded now, so these are up on high hills, which would not have been the case. But anyway, it's high elevation. Um, it doesn't look like a basin where, where, things are, where water is transporting things into the basin. But that's not necessarily an important issue. You look back through geological history, there have been many places that were basins at one time that are now been pushed up and are no longer a basin. So there's, you got to consider the tectonic activity and how it shifts these. These are up at high elevation. Uh, maybe it wasn't so much at some time. That needs to be weighed against uh, the other evidence we've looked at. <coughs> and one question, can, can you transport trunks and stumps and preserve them up and still remain upright? That's a very big question. Uh, how can you do that? How can you carry it a trunk, a, a tall tree, 45 feet tall. How can you carry it in here and have it upright? And the stumps, how can they all be upright? Well, we got some help with this um, by a, a little explosion that occurred. Um, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted. <coughs> and of course, that this is in Oregon. Mount St. Helens was this beautiful volcanic cone. Uh, I've eaten so the most delicious strawberries I ever ate were up on the side of Mount St. Helens, little wild strawberries on land that does not exist anymore. I have a map of that area before and after, and you can s I can see kind of where I was picking strawberries, and that's just gone now. Um, Mount St. Helens was a serious eruption. Uh, left uh, Harry Truman buried 200 feet down below this area. Uh, he refused to leave his little lodge there, and then that was then covered by massive amounts of sediment. <coughs> and Mount St. Hel uh, Spirit Lake was there before, but the, the, this, all of this action um, kind of lifted the lake up because it's 
new sediment underneath it and moved it a little bit, but it's still there. <laughs> and all, uh, for, for long distance around the volcano, the trees were just blasted, knocked flat. <coughs> and their um, limbs largely ripped off and um, you have a lot of stumps and a lot of logs lying around. Well, when, uh, when all this was occurring, the water in Spirit Lake splashed way up on the sides of those mountains there and brought all the trees down into the, to the lake. So it was a half covered in the early days uh, with this log jam. That's just a solid mass of logs and stumps. Here you can see some, some stumps um, or some logs floating upright. There are others in here, but they're, they're kind of hidden among all the logs. But there's been a, a lot of research done on, on those. Um, <coughs> here's the log jam. Here are some, some logs uh, oriented upright. These are leaning a bit, and they found that that's, that happens when if the bottom of the log is lightly touching the bottom and the water isn't deep enough to, to let it go upright. And it, it can turn different directions, but uh, ones that are fl floating free in the water are upright. And that's because apparently water enters the tree more readily from one end, from the lower end. And so you get waterlogged on that end first, and they, they sit upright. <coughs> Uh, here are some stumps sitting upright in the water for the same reason. More logs, uh, some upright, others are resting on the bottom and tilting. And they, how do they know that? Well, they did, um, did a quite a bit of scuba diving. Go down in the water to see what's really happening if what they think is happening is, is true. And it, it, it is. The ones that are tilted are kind of lightly touching the bottom, not rooted by any means, but touching. Others are, are upright. And through the years, these different kinds of logs have sunk. Uh, different species will sink at different rates. And so um, there's not so many trees there now. Here's some beautiful upright ones, which uh, you know, in, in certain areas, this was examined by uh, scuba divers. You can see a better picture of these hillsides that are stripped of all their, their trees by the water sloshing up uh, and down on this, on these uh, slopes. They also did side scan sonar. You have a boat and you have this sonar you put in the water that um, looks out sideways and it gives you a picture. Um, scuba divers couldn't cover a large area of the lake because it's just very dark and very cold and very deep. <laughs> but they could get a, a, a larger area study by using side scan sonar. So here would be upright trees and other material lying on the bottom. <coughs> and indeed, the, the, that general picture held um, all across the lake. Um, one argument has br been brought up by somebody here at Loma Linda. Well, yeah, sure, that's all nice, but um, Spirit Lake doesn't look like Yellowstone Fossil Forest. Spirit Lake, you go to the bottom, it's just a log jam. Everything is piled out there on the bottom. Yellowstone, they're separated out in different layers. Well, that, that's, not a, that's not even a useful argument because there is a very great difference between Spirit Lake and, Ye and the Yellowstone Fossil Forest. In the Fossil Forest area, you had successive volcanic uh, deposits coming in at, at intervals of time. Okay, th th there's no sediment coming into Spirit Lake after the main, um, main event. Uh, but if, if you did have volcanic deposits coming into the lake at periodic intervals, you would expect that as one came in, the, the material that was on the bottom would be buried. And then later on you have another layer and it would bury the, some of the other material falling down. And it would look pretty much just like the fossil forest. Okay, well what about these logs, these stumps still? Um, well, what they found is that the stumps do saturate with water from the bottom, and they sink down and, and land upright. And it's, it, there's, there's more than that going on. Um, this is a, a massive amount of sediment, volcanic sediment, brought down the Tula River Valley from, from, um, from the mountain. And <clears throat> so this is all coarse volcanic material. And it's been brought down at high speed through this valley, uh, and a lot of logs and 
stumps brought with it. Well, here you see the stumps. Okay, they aren't, they didn't grow there. Uh, some of them are buried, you couldn't say for sure, but, but um, and these are, these are not fossil trees. These are from the living trees. Um, but they, where you can see the whole thing, they're just sitting on the, on the ground or even on a highway. Some of them are sitting on a highway. They obviously didn't grow there. So somehow these trees, these stumps, came 50 or 60 miles at high speed down this winding river valley and still maintained their upright position and stayed in that position when they were deposited. So there, there's, there are interesting things about the flow uh, of sediment or water uh, and what it does to the materials that are in it. They tend to, stay, in this case, tend to stay upright. To illustrate how a lot of those things don't happen intuitively, the way we would intuitively think. There are experiments done with turbidites. That's, turbidite is a deposit produced by a rapid flow of sediment uh, down a slope into water, and it doesn't have to be a very steep slope. They can go up to 60 miles per hour, the turbidites. And some experiments where they put, before they let the, the turbidite flow uh, go, they put a, a tin can sitting in there. Okay, you'd expect that high speed flow to just knock that flying, right? Well, it, nothing happened to it. It, it. it flowed around it and left the can sitting there. So, <coughs> Geology is not always intuitive. You have to see what actually happens to know. And in this case, we see that the, they do stay upright. Okay, another argument was brought that, well, yeah, fossil trees, though, um, or, or I mean, any kind of living trees going into a lake like that, you'd expect them to kind of get washed together into bunches. Uh, okay, is that real? Is that the way it happens? Well. They, to answer that, <coughs> they took, um, um, used uh, a GPS to determine the, the, the position of these different upright trees in the lake, and they're not bunched. They're, they're kind of spread the way you'd expect a normal forest. So intuition is not adequate. You've got to do the research. Okay, so uh, looking at the fossil trees with the rainbow there, we can Oops. Start thinking about some more things. Here, um, here are some publications that came from that. This one is in Origins, published by GR GRI. The others are all in, in very good geological journals. So this was not just a backyard uh, exercise. They, these people did careful scientific research and got it published in some very good journals. <coughs> Now we can ask the question, okay, so why then were the creationists the one that found the evidence for the transported forest and did the research to verify that? Why was it the creationists who did this? Because nobody else did it. Um, and I think there's a very good reason why that's so. You just look at process of science and of human nature. The general appearance is that these are in situ forests, meaning grown, where they, where they are now. That's what it looks like if you just go out and look at it. And that seemed compelling. And naturalistic scientists, who, who those who do not believe in a flood, global flood or anything, this kind of stuff, um, who, who follow at least part of Lyell's idea that you, you interpret ancient deposits by looking at what happens today. Okay, those who are thinking that way they had no motivation to dig deeper and for more detailed information, to do more detailed research. Because this fits their view just fine. Okay, so why, you know, why look any further? This is obviously right. And so they had no motivation to dig deeper and to ask deeper questions. The Bible believers saw past the surface, what you saw on the surface, or were motivated to examine more closely. Um, and that's why they are the ones who did the research. And so after the initial studies, all of the research after that about how they got there was all done by creationists for, this, for these reasons. Um, if, um, <coughs> well, let me give you an example. Um, I can remember a time when I would drive down the highway and there'd be all these cars I knew were called Toyotas. 
okay, well, they were just obstacles I had to get past to get go as fast as I wanted to go or get where I want to go. Um, but then I, I started reading reports about cars, about reliability and uh, durability and all these things. And I began to see things I hadn't seen before. I began to learn something about um, the quality of different cars. And all of a sudden, I saw the Toyotas different. Um, I saw them, uh, you know, with a little, with more respect. A little bit of my worldview had changed. I knew, now knew something I didn't know before. Um, these were these cars were uh, exceptional cars, and um, I'd see a Toyota four-wheel drive forerunner going by. I would see it with more respect and a little longing. I'd like to have one of those someday. Okay, so by knowing more information, my worldview changed. And I saw it different. Well, our worldview causes us to ask questions that the others don't ask. Because their worldview doesn't give them any reason to ask those questions. And so, so we do see things that they don't see. When I, I read a lot of the anti-creation literature, books and articles, because I want to know what they're saying and how do I respond to it. But reading those, those books especially, it's obvious to me that these guys who write this anti-creationist stuff have no idea how an educated creationist thinks. And often, they, as a result, they end up saying very foolish things. Okay, so they only know one world view when it comes to this geological stuff. They know the standard mainline theory. Okay, that's often true of creationists. They don't really read, you know, many, many don't. But for a creationist scientist, we have the opportunity to be well aware of both theories. They are not. They are not aware of both theories in any kind of meaningful way. But we understand both. We have to know their point of view if we're going to do science. Um, so we are aware of both, and we seek ways to test between them. I'm all the time asking myself, OK, how they think this way, I think this way. How can we test between at least some parts of that? And so that is a difference. And that's why our eyes are more open and why we often see things that they don't see. So do you have any questions? Yeah. Uh, you showed on the slopes. Uh, it's a dry area now. The stereo. No, what, what we saw pictures of was on a dry slope, and then the Spirit Lake was wet. So that would um, your your theory would hold if it were a wet environment, so the stumps would find an upright position. So was this wet? Do you think as this was being laid down, and then the water went away afterwards? Well, that that would be the theory we would propose. That the you had to bring in the volcanic stuff came from nearby. You can identify where it, a lot of it came from. But the, the, the trees that were growing under different environments, they had to have been brought in from somewhere and all this. So you had to take, you had to have a lot of water flowing around. Okay, what, what we saw were stumps. Uh, I might expect to see more whole trees. So was the initial blast, did that knock off the top of the trees and then the stumps flowed down later? Okay, well, we talk about the stumps and the trees. The, there, are, there are trunks that, ha that have some roots at the bottom. So you do find more or less complete ones. But uh, a lot of them, especially these big ones, they, the, the, they've been torn apart. And the stumps are separate from the trunks. But not always. And final question, did you ever get a Toyota? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have one. And, and I, my next, my next four-wheel drive vehicle is going to have to be a Toyota. <laughs> <laughs> question. Um, could you discuss the the volcanic material there? Okay, it's and um, what light that might shed on it. Yeah, it's uh, a lar lot of it is rather large pieces, class, uh, breccia broken up, or or rounded cobbles of, and they're often it's very coarse. I mean, you got pieces various sizes up to several feet in diameter and that that's one problem as well because you got some of these rather thin stumps I mean, I mean uh, trunks sitting upright uh, is it likely that a, that a thin tree 
is going to withstand being battered by these big boulders and still stay upright? I don't think so. So that also fits better with the, um, the upright model. What about the location? I mean, um, you can identify differences. It would be theoretically possible. I don't know what was found there. But to identify this is from one volcanic eruption, mm -hmm. this is from another, or maybe it's mixed together. Yeah, actually a study was done on that by Clyde Webster. <coughs> okay. And I wish he had completed that and published it, but he, he never did. Um, maybe you get somebody else to take it over, I don't know. But, but you, you can use um, mass spectroscopy, uh, or IC, mm. ICPMS, was that what he used? Trace element analysis. Trace. Anyway, trace, what he did was trace element analysis. Okay, you can do, see the, the ratios of the different elements that are in trace amounts in the rock, mm -hmm. and you can, find, you can determine uh, possibly where it came from. And there are, he found about four different trace element signatures. And he located the peaks where three of those were coming from. Couldn't find the fourth one. And so these, these volcanoes were going off. This would put a layer in, this one would put a layer in, and this one would put a layer in, and you know, randomly arranged as you go up. And so you can find where it came from. Much were there repeats of, um, in other words, did the same volcano leave different, s different layers? Yeah, yeah, it did. So they, okay. they were not all blowing off all at the same time. There was Do we have any idea of what the um, radioisotope dating might? No, you can't do that. Well, yes, you can, anyway, it's if there's some way to answer. Because it would be interesting if there was agreement or disagreement with the locations of those, even though signatures might agree. Um, I, I don't remember seeing whether they've dated any of those. I don't know if it has dateable material in it or not. Okay. Um, and the one, one thing that Clyde was pursuing, and that is he, he did a lot of research on Hawaii, on these volcanoes. And you could determine that a, you know, a given volcano would have a number of eruptions through the years. And the signature would change with different eruptions. So he was trying to see if you could find that same thing in the Yellowstone for uh, you know, layers and determine, maybe get an idea of the time frame. Because these ones in Yellowstone, it isn't that long necessarily from when you have a, a change in the signature. But he didn't finish that. So we're left wondering. He needed some more controls to be sure he understood the, the, the time frame, and it, that part wasn't done. I have uh, two questions. One is the process of petrification. Did that take place before or after the transport? And the other question is, you said that uh, some of those trees are uh, upright because uh, the bottom is heavier than the top. Now, does that apply to <coughs> petrify trees as well? Can't, can't answer that from actual data. But I, I, you know, using intuition as far as it goes, I would think that a petrified tree would be too heavy to be carried by water that way and be affected the same way. I would think that the petrification had to occur after, after it was brought into place. So, the water, or whatever the water is coming from, it will have minerals in it, and that will determine whether the tree gets petrified. Oh, okay. Hi. I've got several questions, but I'm going to ask the, just this one right now. What's the current follow-up on Spirit Lake? Is it pretty static now, or is there still stuff going on? Is there people exploring it? Research going on. Um, <laughs> At the time when all this research was going, it was in the 70s and, and 80s, probably early 80s, um, the park, the, na the national park up there, actually changed their signs. There'd be signs on the highway talking about these forests, describing them with a standard model, um, forests that grew there. And they actually changed their signs and took that part out. Uh, but there, there has not been any research done for years. And I, I, I think that's unfortunate. I tried 
through the years to get somebody interested in this because <coughs> there was some really good research done, but there wasn't, there needs to be quite a bit more to kind of finish it and tie it together and really make a strong case for this. Well, that hasn't happened and uh, just haven't been the right people to take the interest and, and do it. Um, and it, it would be, I understand in some ways it would be harder now because for one thing, you know, at that time we used to just hike up through the woods and go up there to the trees. Try to stay away from the grizzlies. There, that is one hazard. It's grizzly country. But now there have been pro problems that have killed off a lot of trees. And so you have a hopeless mat <coughs> of, of fallen logs and it it's takes a few hours to even get up there. So it'd be harder now, but I still wish somebody would pursue it. Leonard? Helicopter. Yeah. Leonard, I just might add to his question. Uh, I was up there a couple of years ago the raft is still there. It's still being on the lake. On the lake, yeah. And there are still a few upright trees mm -hmm. uh, poking out, mm -hmm. as Leonard showed you earlier. How old are the trees? How old? No, not not at Spirit Lake, but the ones, the fossil ones there. How are they all about the same age, or are there great age differences between? No, there's them? there's a wide variation. Okay, from s small ones up to a thousand rings. Are they considered, this is my last question, are they considered to be come from before the flood or after the flood? My, the reason being is because if they've got rings like <coughs> seasons, you know, before the flood we don't mm -hmm. consider they had major seasons. So how did that come about? Well, um, I don't have a good answer to any of those questions. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what exactly was happened after the flood, and when, what, during the flood. And, um, this is Eocene, which I would think, for some reasons, that, that Paul Buchheim could speak to, that this is probably after, or at least during that still difficult period as, the, as things were winding down and coming more into equilibrium. As uh, far as the rings, I don't, I don't know if there were rings before the flood or not. Um. I had the privilege of climbing St. Helens just before the volcano, such a beautiful mountain turned ugly. Mm. If you go south of Mount Rainier in some of those valleys, Puyallup and in there, they're putting in housing developments and as they rearrange the earth, they're finding big stumps from prior experience just like mm. St. Helens. Mm -hmm. Has there been any comparison between those kinds of stump areas and your uh, mountain heights? Yeah, there's <clears throat> there are other areas outside of Yellowstone that have fossil trees. Um, there, um, I haven't seen a lot of direct comparison. And one of the problems is the, in Yellowstone, you have these nice exposed hillsides. The other places, that's not as good exposure. So you can't do the extensive detailed research that you'd like to do. <coughs> I'm, I'm just wondering, maybe somebody asked this before, but I'm not sure I heard the answer. Uh, has anybody dated the fossil forests? Um, well, <coughs> in general, the, the, those, that's Eocene and, and up into Miocene. So it must have been dated some, although I haven't pursued that. I, I presume those are good dates, I don't know. Has anybody looked at uh, radiocarbon in them? I don't know if that's been pursued. I don't think so. And, okay, let me, let me say this. <coughs> you know, th there were those in the 70s who were very sure they had demonstrated that these grew there, the Bible is wrong. Well, the data have gone against them, but um, I have still have to say, None of us can be dogmatic about this. There's um, such complex things. We don't have all the answers. I don't have the answer as to how you could have so much water at that point carrying these all in. Um, and the others on the other side, they can't answer a lot of the things that have been brought up by this research. It's just, um, there's a lot of data that makes it hard to believe for me that those things grew there in place. There's just too many big anomalies. 
Do you still have people using the Yellowstone fossil forest as a knockdown argument? I think there are. Uh, there's, there are certain groups who, who think that, well, these creations, I mean, they don't know what they're doing, so we'll stick with what, what we were thinking before. Um, but I, I don't know for sure. There, there are so many other things come along that maybe that's just eclipsed fossil forests. Well, the other, the other thing is that I have run into people who said, okay, well, you've taken care of the Yellowstone fossil forest, but what about the ones in New Zealand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll, you'll have that all the time. It's, um, I don't know, I've, I've, my observation has been that <coughs> many people <coughs> at some point in their life decide to make a decision, philosophical decision, am I going to go with what most scientists say or am I, do I b believe that God knows better? And for many people, once they, on, on either side of the question, once they've made that decision, data don't matter anymore. Um, they've already made their decision. So. And there's, there's too many things out there to study that any of us are going to fully settle the whole thing before Jesus comes. But it's fun to try. It's fun to work on it. Somebody have the final answer? I, I <laughs> like to hear. I don't know if I'm talking out of turn or not. Was, I've heard some talk about a potluck somewhere. May, do you want to say anything about it, Paul? Well, um, I think that the date is still being determined. I have not heard a firm final date, but it looks like they're trying to get a potluck started in July. So those of you who are interested are certainly welcome to uh, come as soon as the people who are organizing the thing figure out exactly when it's going to be. And they'll try to organize it so that everybody doesn't show up with uh, drinks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how. Yeah. Um, we have one more comment back here. We, we're considering, we think it's going to work out for July 19. Okay, so that's the latest word from the people who know the most. So. It's interesting in the debate with Bill Nye and, and so forth that he kept making a point that creationism can't predict, but I think the, this and I think the ENCODE project did a nice job of showing that a different worldview does predict, mm -hmm. and the people quit saying 95% was junk DNA and quit looking, and those that didn't quit looking and creationists would have a different point of view, would find, yes, there's a whole lot of things going on in the rest of the DNA. And I think that was an excellent example of the fact mm -hmm. that a creation worldview did give them a basis to keep looking, and they did find what they predicted they would find. I remember molecular biologists here at Loma Linda in the early 70s predicting that junk DNA would not be junk. It turned out to be something important. And I've, I'm working on an article about predictions from a creationist point of view. And there's just a whole lot of them you can make. And, uh, you know, one, there, there are hazards that, that come from some of these kind of phenomena that we've been talking about. You know, talked about this big mud flow down the uh, Toodle River. Volcanic, all this volcanic material washing down. Well, it, it's well known that if, if Mount Rainier gives a serious explosion, Parts of Seattle are going to just be inundated. So <laughs> better be careful where you move to in, in Seattle. People don't really think about that when they buy a house. Well, I want to thank you very much, Dr. Brand, mm -hmm. for helping us out with our uh, the Yellowstone Fossil Forest. And uh, um, again, uh, in two weeks, uh, we're looking forward to another talk, this time on Ellen White. And uh, next week, we'll be talking about paleo currents, so hopefully it'll all be stuff that's interesting and probably useful to you. <laughs>